Hello, and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, I have as my guest, Ben Elijah. Ben is someone who is very outspoken in the arena of sales enablement. We're going to be talking about how sales enablement evolved, why it came about, and what's broken in it, and what we need to do to fix it. Ben, welcome. Thanks, Marcus. Good to be here. Excellent. Would you mind giving the audience 60 seconds on your history, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Ben Elijah. I've been in the game of sales enablement now for, um, God, about 10 years or so. So I've seen I've seen it evolve from what it used to be to what it is today. In terms of my background, um, I started out in the aerospace industry. I spent about eight years working at Apple, which is how I got into enablement. And I now work with companies, particularly in the tech space, to improve their sales operation and make sure that their sellers uh, are doing what they need to be doing. So for those who are unfamiliar with enablement, what is sales enablement, first off? Yeah, yeah sure. Well, sales enablement is the, is the practice of making sure that sellers have the tools, the techniques, and the knowledge uh, so that they can have uh, what I like to call it, uh, the right conversations with the right customers at the right time. So how does this differ from an internal sales training team? It's a good question. Sales training is fundamentally about sales behaviors. So if you think about your traditional sales training or sales models, sales methodologies like Sandler, Challenger, Miller-Hyman, et cetera, sales training is about how people can apply that. And sales enablement combines that and also applies uh, or should be applying product messaging. It should be applying the tech stack. And in addition, it takes on certain, uh, and we'll talk about this later, certain L&D functions as well, like sales onboarding. Okay. So... Talk to me about the evolution of sales enablement then. Where did it start out and how has it ended up? Well, I can, I'm, I can tell you about my journey with sales enablement um, and how it's evolved as far as I've seen it, um, because different people are going to have different perspectives on how it's evolved. You're going to have some people in enablement now who started out as trainers, and you have some people in, in enablement who started out as sellers. And their perspective on it is going to be you know, very different. My perspective, I started out in sales. So for me, it's always been a very practical profession. How it started out, I think, to be perfectly honest with you, it was really sales training by any other name is sort of how it started, particularly in the SaaS space. And then it evolved to take on more of these responsibilities. And it's quite interesting to see the growth of sales enablement with how the CRO role has evolved. So the best sales enablement uh, departments or teams, I should say, they kind of operate as the right hand of the CRO. How it's evolving now, however, um, well, you know, we'll ignore the sort of top of the <laughs> the, the top uh, tier enablement teams. For the majority, it's really L and D by any other name right now. So they're being measured on training activities performed. You know, they're thinking about you know putting people through the same kind of shit that L and D have been putting uh, people through for twenty or thirty years now. And so it's evolving, in my view, in quite a dark direction. I know you're seeing that as well. I mean, without being overly pejorative, uh, the majority of sales enablement uh, folk I've come across um, have been people desperately looking for an excuse to have a job. Now, that said, I've seen some phenomenal ones. So there are people like Rod Jefferson, Anita Nielsen, Karen Young, and they are so far apart from the average humdrum sales enablement practitioner. And it's clear that they are a strategic function and they're all about driving results. Whereas what I've seen from my engagements over the years with L&D, they seem to be fixated on things like knowledge retention. I don't give a damn how much they remember. I, I care about how much they implement, whether the results improve. If they haven't got the particular wording of an upfront contract or something like that, I, I don't care as long as the outcome is delivered. And there's generally no emphasis at all on reinforcement and practice of any real substance. This is the key thing, Marcus, because a good enablement professional would be perfectly happy if people are selling, you know, dressed in a chicken suit, clucking down the phone, if it's giving the customer a good experience and it's delivering the numbers. 
but the bad enablement people are more concerned about, you know, to what extent have people done what I told them? So again, this speaks to something else, which is about the command and control mentality. And it also speaks to how organizations are led and measured. Mm. So talk to me about how good enablement interacts with senior leadership to execute their vision within the sales team. Well, good enablement fundamentally needs to not be an order taker. That's absolutely critical. If we start out with how to do it wrong, you can be an order taker and work with sales leaders, but they're always going to tell you to spend 80% of your time on the bottom 20%. And, you know, quite frankly, it's the 20% that they don't have the balls to fire. And that's a waste of your time. It's a waste of their time. And quite frankly, it's, a, it's doing a disservice to the people who need to go find success elsewhere. The good enablement person is working as a partner with leadership. So essentially, they're their eyes and ears on the ground because they do understand the sales practice. They do understand sales processes probably more to more of an extent or to a greater extent than sales leadership do. So they can say, hey, here's this person. Here's my diagnosis. Here's my prescription. Let's work together on the treatment. So okay. as far as interacting with the sellers are concerned. And then as far as the business is concerned, the other thing is around messaging and marketing. So do we make sure that we're equipping sellers with, how would you say, sort of if it's a tech sale, tech speeds and feeds, or are they talking to customers about problems and outcomes? And enablement is in a position to work with leadership to make sure that A, people are talking to the customers about problems and outcomes. And if they're not, they can go ahead and fix the issue. So in effect, I think I'm hearing you tell me they're a bit like a knowledge transfer hub where they're pulling insights from the field and identifying what marketing, what sales, what leadership, what management input is required, and then uh, going back to the sales team and equipping them with the tools, the resources, the talk tracks, and uh, ensuring that they're practicing those skills they're implementing what's required in order to deliver a safe buyer experience and to actually drive sales performance. You've got it. You've right. nailed it. It's just, if I were to summarize it in a sentence, it's almost like being the customer's representative to the sales team. Interesting. So the good ones, that is. Actually, an accusation that will be leveled back at you, <laughs> uh, which is that um, you know, how do we prevent sales enablement from going native. Hmm. Tell me a little bit more about what that means. Well, often I've heard in the past when a salesperson has been very strongly defensive of the customer for the right reasons, they get told, you're not working for the fucking customer, you work for us. And so as a result, there's this pressure from leadership to then go out and do stuff to the customer put them under pressure at the end of the quarter, cannibalize the pipeline, or all the usual stuff that you see going on in badly run growth orient, brute force growth orientated sales organizations. Mm. Well, I think this is a deeper issue, to be honest. And it's something that enablement traditionally has not really been involved in. And I think it's moving in this direction, which is how do we organize sales activities so that they meet the needs of the customer instead of some arbitrary funnel that we're just going to force the customer through, which is how things are being done at the moment. And it's why you see behaviors like fire sales at the end of the quarter. And I think probably leading to some of the pressure that you're talking about here. If we're organizing our activities by saying, well, I know at this particular stage of the process, this customer is kicking tires. What do I need to do to give them the best experience? Or, you know, they're at the stage now where, you know, maybe they're thinking about putting some sort of RFP together. What do I do to make sure they're getting a good experience? And then further and further along. And then you're able to say to them, well, look, there's no bloody point in me putting pressure to close them at the end of quarter three, because, you know, they're still at this stage of the process. They don't feel safe enough to do it. And yeah, fine, we can crash the, the margins. We can crash the product. But now I've, hold, I've held the customer hostile to a decision that wasn't fully baked. So that customer's likelihood of churning later on is much higher. So... That's really down to the wisdom of how we organize our sales processes and our sales methodologies. Are we starting with the needs of the customer or with our own needs? I want to pick up on something that you said earlier because I want to shine a spotlight on it. When you have um, the bottom 20%, which leadership are too gutless to fire, 
actually what we should be doing is looking at the root cause of that problem. The questions going through my mind is, why did we hire those specific people? Should we have? Did we set them up to fail through the pre-onboarding, onboarding, training, accountability, their expectation setting? And how have we continued to fail them since then? Because th these are people's livelihoods that we're talking about. And it's also about the company's reputation as an employer. And as a result, what you will often find, I, I was talking to one of my partners who's a recruiter, and I work closely with her, and she turned down a piece of business with a vendor precisely because of the culture, the environment, the hire and fire mentality, the language that the hiring manager was using to indicate, well, if I make a placement here, I do my candidate a disservice. And it's refreshing to see someone who is willing to do that. But too often, the salespeople are blamed. And God knows, they do have 50% of their, uh, the responsibility for their own development. But if they don't know any better, and they're operating scared, chances are they're just going to comply. And if you set them up to fail, they'll fail, and then you'll kick them out. And you'll feel a little bit smug that you've done something to improve the business, when in fact, you're just 20% you know, behind where you should have been mm. um, because of uh, bad culture, bad leadership, bad management, bad onboarding, bad recruitment. So what, what I'm curious about is what's enablement's role to challenge acts of idiocy and self-sabotage within the sales and marketing operation and leadership? Yeah, it's a really good question. First and foremost, we need to examine a couple of assumptions because I think you, you've touched on something very important, but I think we, we need to go a little bit further as well. One of the reasons I do enablement is I want to see sales as a, respect, as a respected profession like architecture or like medicine. Now, I want to see salespeople not embarrassed to advertise their profession at dinner parties. And unfortunately, that means that we need to be a little bit more exclusive. To get into architecture, to get, to get into medicine, there's rigorous training. You need to be the best of the best, one hopes. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. So uh, there, there needs to be some element of selection going on here. The assumption that, oh, well, everybody can sell, I'm sorry, it's not the case. It just isn't. You know, we can have conversations about IQ and EQ, but the fundamental thing is that some people are equipped to do it. Some people can hit the ground running and just nail sales. Some people, we can't. So recruitment needs to look for the characteristics that lead to a higher probability of great salesmanship or salespersonship, excuse me. So that's the first thing I think we need to say. Not everybody can do this. So we do need to be thinking about selection. As far as you know, the other practice that we sometimes see, we can often, I mean, I see this quite a lot in organizations, particularly if they're a little bit more old school, they'll bring someone in who's been selling for 30 or 40 years. Um, and they say, oh, he's got 30 or 40 years of experience. He knows everybody. All right. Does he have 30 or 40 years of experience? Or does he just have one year repeated 30 or 40 times? And he might know everybody, but does everyone know him? You know, so one question that's really good to ask in interviews when people start flaunting their address book is to say, oh, fantastic. So, you know, this person, wonderful. Hey, the last time he or she invited you for a coffee, what did you talk about? Uh, oh, busted. So in, do you recruit that person or do you recruit someone who might not necessarily have the contacts, might not necessarily have the experience, but they've got the raw emotional intelligence, they've got the capability and they've got the attitude and the will and the cultural fit. Yeah, you, you hire for what you can't train. Of course. It's as simple as that. Now, here's the other problem that you didn't touch on, but I think it's important to mention. Sales is getting more and more complicated. Yeah, I mean, certainly within technology, that's fair. I think there are still uh, a lot of commodity sales roles, but those, I believe, are going to disappear through intelligent, personalized websites. Marketing uh, is making massive strides. AI. So I, I reckon 20 to 30% of all sales roles will disappear uh, and be replaced by technology. I think um, probably a lot more than that. Well, I, I think another 30 to 
will disappear from vendors and they will move into the channel. Already today, over 75% of all products sold across all 26 vertical markets globally are sold through the channel. Direct sales actually is the um, ginger-haired, ugly stepdaughter, and uh, the channel is the golden child. However, the people in leadership positions have typically come from direct sales. So that's where their emphasis is. And they have this command and control mentality, which causes them to favor the direct sales operation. Well, you know, look, to bring it back to the point about, you know, about recruitment, about how, how do we avoid a hire and fire culture? I think it's important to acknowledge that someone might have been in your organization for 10 years, and it was absolutely fine 10 years ago to be, you know, not to be pejorative about it, but to be an order taker, to be someone who just fills out, you know, 40 page RFPs all day long. I don't think there's much of a future left for that way of working. No. Right. So however we slice it, I think we're going to be creating a situation where the distance between the top performers and the bottom performers is only ever going to grow. So as sales gets more complicated, you magnify the differences between people's kind of innate capability. And I think we need to acknowledge that because that's very difficult. And it puts much more of an onus on great recruitment where enablement steps in. Something um, a mentor said to me once is hire slow, fire fast to avoid a hire and fire culture. So do you have a robust onboarding program with plenty of checks? Do you have an onboarding program that's a, that is able to sort of simulate the most demanding sales interactions and say, oh, hello, we've got some alarm bells here. Let's think about some coaching. Let's give them, you know, another try. Let's try something different. Let's try it three, four, five times. And if we're still seeing alarm bells at this point, maybe we need to have a, a difficult conversation. So we're not setting this person up for failure. Well, I, I think this is where expectation setting and uh, clear consequences for both positive and negative behavior yeah. are clear. An escalation process so that uh, salespeople are not left in the dark. I think there's a, a model that I'm working on with Simon Byrne at the moment uh, around loyalty. And along one spectrum, you have mistrust to trust, and then you have collaborative versus exploitative on the vertical axis. And those who are mistrustful but collaborative will have a tendency to be quite conservative and be very contractual. Mm -hmm. Now, you can kind of work with that, but that tends to be a fairly rigid type of relationship. Then you have people who are high on mistrust and high on the exploitative spectrum, and they have a tendency to be very protective about their territories. They're not collaborative at all, and their primary driver is to take and that's where I think an awful lot of salespeople have grown up. And those are the sorts of people that leadership has a tendency to hire because they are ruthless. They uh, will do whatever they need. It's dog eat dog. They have this scarcity mentality. They operate with a high degree of self-interest. Then you have the uh, ones who are exploitative, but quite high on the trust spectrum. And they will be um, very controlling. They can be strong promoters, but again, there's an awful lot of control, and mm. that doesn't really feel like a partnership with the customer. And then you have people who are high on collaborative and high on trust, and they become phenomenal advocates. They're people who serve, and they're a great representative to have out in the market. And you need to listen to the language of the seller when you ask about specific examples and I, I would tend to ask for half a dozen at least, and listen to the, to, uh, the sales tonality. What is it that is being expressed in the underlying meaning of their message? Because if they're not people who are service orientated, then chances are, as technology gets far more complex, and the tech stack, I mean, it's just in security, you're going to have 12 to 20 different vendors. In sales and marketing technology, God knows how many. I mean, I've seen technology spaghetti with 15 different vendors. You've got you know, automation in marketing. You've got sequences. Uh, you've got AI. You've got uh, auto dialers and all this kind of stuff. If you don't know how to play nicely with others, even your close competitors, then I think your future 
in technology sales is extremely limited. So you would suggest that we need to be finding people that are high in trust, high in collaborative, so that they're able to then partner with other organizations, even competitors. And internally, they need to partner as well. Of course, yeah. Uh, if you can't get discretionary effort from your own team. And I, I remember interviewing a phenomenal saleswoman who uh, at her last job did 43 million and they paid her $14,500. So she left. What? Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, they, they would rather stiff the salespeople than pay the commission. And now they've lost her and she's now working with a competitor and would be going after taking their customers away. Uh, it's, um, Dar it's Darwinism at work, Marcus. Yeah, the, 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 you know, the, um, survival of the stupidest seems to be the theme, though. Now, she was uh, really adamant that the hardest issue she ever faced through 25 years in sales was trying to get your own people to do what's necessary. So here's the rub. I think what we need to be considering is what does sales enablement look like when the only people who are in sales are those who are, as you would say, sort of most high on the spectrum on trust and collaborative. Because I think that world for enablement, I'm speaking about my profession here, is going to be very, very different to what it is today. Yeah, well, I hope agree? so. God knows it's needed. Yeah, 100%. Can I throw some ideas at you in that case? Because this is something I've been considering uh, very yeah. carefully. And, um, cool. you know, I'm very excited in particular I know you always ask for book recommendations. Two of mine are going to be Sales Enablement 3.0 by Rob Jefferson yeah. and Tech Powered Sales, and the authors of which has escaped me. Uh, Jessica regular. and Tony Hughes. Your encyclopedic knowledge of authors, I have no idea. In another That's life, you might have been a the, librarian. The reason I set the podcast up, Ben, was because I wanted to interview great authors. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, I, I better remember them. <laughs> well, I've, got another, I've got another book coming out next year, but I don't know if I describe myself as a great author just yet. But, um, okay. So, look, I think, so if we're agreed that order takers are going to be a thing of the past and the sales is going to be the preserve of, as we say, the most trusting, the most collaborative, the highest in IQ, the highest in EQ, the people that are able to deliver the most sophisticated outcomes. And, and PQ, partner in quotient. The ability ah. to collaborate, I think, is going to be a really critical. Fantastic. So I think what those people need is very different. What you don't want to be doing with someone like that is sitting them through 13 or 14 bloody hours of recorded you know, bloke in a suit lecturing into a camera sales training. Well, let, let, let me just make a statement here because it's really important. The gold standard for online training course completion, and this is the likes of Tony Robbins and Chet Holmes and those sorts of people, is 3%, okay? The myth that putting training online and uh, calling it training, frankly, is an insult, and the, the problem here is that if you look at the way those training courses are structured, delivered, assessed, it goes in one eye out the other because people oh, yeah. don't pay any heed to it. Behavior doesn't change. Results don't change. You know, the evidence is out there. The results are not. 100%. Now, I, I don't reject e-learning sort of in principle, but I think it's the right, that you need to do it the right way. Um, Rob yeah. Jefferson talks about the idea of a knowledge bite. And it blew my mind when I read it, because it took what, like I used to take 90 minutes to train people how to do elevator pitches. Mm -hmm. Once I started implementing knowledge bites and combined it with some experiential learning principles, that became a video that I use now, which is exactly three minutes and 44 seconds long, combined with tests and not tests, excuse me, assessments later down the road, because I know that most of the knowledge is not going to come from the training. Most of the knowledge is going to come from practical experience followed yeah. up by coaching where it's needed. And again, to back that up, Gartner states very clearly 70% of learning happens in the field, on the job, away from the training, uh, training room. 100%. And the only way to embed skills is through repetition and practice. And it's not just practice, it's deliberate, intentional, perfect practice makes perfect. So I would invite every VP of sales, every CRO, whatever you call themselves, to look at the onboarding program that your sales enablement or sales training people have put together for your people and ask yourself this question, when does, the, when does my onboarded member of staff first talk to a customer? 
And I would argue if it's not within the first week, there's a problem. And then if you're putting training together, is every sort of key message being assessed for whether it's being used, not used, or whether it can be used competently in the field? You know, because what we don't want to be doing is, is command and control, but what we do want to be doing is making sure that if you are going to train something, that everybody thinks it's of practical value. I'm not sure I 100% agree. I'm willing to be wrong, but I want my people, when I onboard them as a CRO, to have put the time into researching their market. I want them to understand the moving parts, and I want them to practice. So I'm CRO for a company called Mobile Practice, yep. and we create small interventions, which are a few seconds to a few minutes long, with clear instruction and a clear indication of how they will be evaluated. Mm. And then we can give direct coaching to them until they practice, until both sides are happy. We can then turn those into best practice videos. I'm using them in the recruitment process as well, because I want to test for coachability. And you coach what you see as a manager. So how, again, many, how many people as a percentage are engaged in learning or engaged in, in their own self-development, typically, do you see at the moment? Uh, t- typically, the square root of fuck all. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's down to a, you know, maybe one, two, three percent. But this is where the on- structured onboarding process and pre-onboarding process is key. So I'm developing 30-day pre-onboarding during their notice period so that they can learn um, that you're using tools like Refract, Uh, to Mm. listen to other calls, see what great looks like, what not so great looks like, mobile practice so that they can practice the skills. Um, I've come across another phenomenal AI technology called Second Nature, where it's an AI for role play. So you program in the persona of the buyer, then you let loose five or six of your top salespeople on Jenny, the AI, and then you let her loose on your sales team. Now, The beauty of this is people can practice in the safety of being anonymous and out of the spotlight, but get real life feedback and the AI learns and just gets better. That's extremely um, cool. Oh, it is brilliant. Um, And if you get, uh, make the time, look at the uh, interview with the uh, head of enablement for Zoom who implemented this. It's a phenomenal story. I think we're, we're, we're saying the same thing fundamentally because my, my argument is that if you're going to train something, for God's sake, don't just sort of lecture people, don't give it to them no. with sort of command and control top down. You need to back it up by making sure that there's coaching and accountability, not because your objective is to make sure that they're actually doing it, but to make sure that people have the tools that they need um, well, in order to give you to give the success that you are being hopefully measured on. But here's the but, thing. If, if I can finish. Yeah, please. I think if you don't do that, that works fine for the most engaged people. But realistically, it, and you need some sort of accountability because your engagement is going to be a, measured on a bell curve fundamentally. So as an enablement practitioner in the real world, you, you have to account for the fact that the majority of people are not going to, even with knowledge bites, you know, they're not necessarily going to engage so you do need to make sure that there's some kind of coaching, some kind of accountability built into the system. But what you're talking about is, well, that doesn't necessarily have to be a human beating them with a stick. It could be this amazing AI that they're using to deliver that coaching and feedback. Is that a yes, fair summary? And, yes, and. Rod Jefferson and I are in the throes of writing a book at the moment, which is the Sales Management Apprenticeship. And the area that I believe enablement really needs to focus on is management enablement. Mm. Uh, With mobile practice, what we find time and time again is this is brilliant, but our managers don't know how to coach. And your typical runway for being a manager is the usual tap on the shoulder. We fired the idiot boss, Ben. You're now the idiot boss. Congratulations, off you go. And what's interesting is that, because I've really put some thought into this. So if you'll indulge me for a moment. Please. um, I, I think that... It's easy to conclude that management and individual contributors as salespeople require a very different set of skills. But as I've grown older and a little bit wiser, I think I was wrong. 
ultimately, the functions and accountabilities are very different, but the underlying values and intent have to be identical. At their best, both require a service and leadership men- uh, mindset. The best salespeople are strategic thinkers. They care really deeply about the success of others, and they help their customers or their reports achieve a better future. They're able to paint a really clear vision, which they develop with their prospects and with their customers and with their team. They're planners who put the time into thinking as their customer, as the salesperson. They put the customer before the commission check. They put the uh, direct report um, ahead of taking the credit. Um, So they give the credit, they give trust. They possess amazing questioning and listening skills. And they understand that listening is the transfer of understanding and meaning. They translate possibilities into action and results. They've got very low self-orientation, which is a fundamental building block of trust. They've got great partnering skills. They're collaborative, cooperative, committed to the success of others. They're humble. They galvanize other people. They encourage massive discretionary effort, very often from people who have no vested interest in the final outcome. They're able to bring resources together, get them playing nicely. They think deeply, read widely. They're self-educated. They take personal responsibility for their own learning and development, and they share what they learn with others. Now, that to me is the foundation of great sales and great management and great leadership. I don't see any of those qualities being exclusive to any one of those three. Now, the problem is that historically, what we want in salespeople are people who are great on the phone, who are great closers, handle objections well. But what you end up with, more often than not, is a selfish and probably slightly narcissistic self-serving individual who's not a great team player, Mm. and then they get put into management. And that's really terrifying. It's an unprofessional. It's not a professional. It's an unprofessional. Yeah, it's the antithesis. And then we're reinforcing it by bringing those people into leadership who are going to recruit and coach and develop, well, if you're lucky. They're not going to coach. And bring more of the same. They're not going to coach because they'll be more interested in either carrying their own number or the hero closer. Yeah. Well, it just reinf- the point is it just reinforces yeah. the unprofession. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's another piece to this as well, which is uh, something we used to talk about quite a lot at Apple. And you can, um, you can find this on YouTube somewhere. It was, we used to use this when we were training. There was a video of Steve Jobs at the developer conference in 1997, who was, back in those days, they used to do Q&As with the audience. And one of the audience asked him a question, sort of really, really forthright question about um, why Apple had killed some particular technology that this guy liked. And Steve Jobs said, and this will stay with me, that people fail because they start with the technology and then work backwards to the customer. They say, oh, we've got all this cool technology. We've got all of this clever stuff. How do we sell it? And what Steve Jobs said was, what you need to do is start instead with the impact you want to have on the customer and then work backwards to all the clever stuff. Yeah. And I think that one area where we fall down, you can have the best messaging and the best sales culture in the world. But if you're talking to the customer about technology first or the clever stuff first, whatever you're selling, and the customer is an afterthought, they will still remain. um, I think you, you often describe it as dangling at the end of a chain of abuse. Yeah, Forgo- a forgotten, inconvenient afterthought at the end of a chain of abuse. You need to print that on a tea towel. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that, that might make me uh, force me to wash up. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've been thinking about this quite a lot recently because messaging around the needs of the customer reflects a big difference in the culture of selling where traditionally the salesperson was the hero. They think of themselves as the person who's going to go in and solve all of the problems and cover themselves in glory and you know, return home with the pot of gold, so to speak. And actually, that the, the customer doesn't want you to be the hero. The customer wants to be the hero themselves. The customer doesn't want you to be Luke Skywalker. The customer wants you to be Obi-Wan. Yeah. Right? The customer doesn't want you to be Aragorn. They want you to be Gandalf. It could go on. 
And that's a big difference. So I think with enablement, one of the ne- one of the characteristics of successful enablement going forward is almost going to be to combine with product or service marketing to say, okay, we've got all of this, these products and services. How do we create messaging that makes the customer the hero? How do you feel about that? Uh, I agree. What really pisses me off is the lack of alignment and communication. I think what COVID may give us is the opportunity to break down the traditional domains that have grown up over the last 40 years. At at the end of uh, Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith says that breaking the production down into areas of specialization ultimately is a bad thing. But turning sales and marketing and uh, customer success and all of that into a pin factory has meant that the customer has become forgotten. Mm-hmm. As everyone is so fixated on the wrong metrics. I, I interviewed Beck Holland a couple of weeks back. And what was really interesting from that conversation was just how wrong the definitions and the uh, measures are around MQLs, SQLs, around uh, the pipeline, around the metrics that the business is trying to measure. And is it any wonder? that you end up with the waste that you have. We, um, at Sales Driven, we did a bit of research to look at the average amount of time that is lost per SDR because of the historic way people in that function uh, operate, which is basically you give them a list list of 5,000 names and they dial from top to bottom. Well, on average, they lose 120 hours a month per SDR. Now, just think about that. There are 4.3 weeks in the month, and three of them are lost to unproductive dead activity that will never, ever, ever yield any positive result. Then you add to the uh, the amount of time that the AEs are now wasting on following up on so-called leads because an MQL being thrown across when it's actually unqualified and the wave funders so investors, VC, uh, private equity, are fixated on pipeline, pipeline, revenue, new logos. And those three things are absolutely the wrong things to measure. You should well, this is, measure. These are the things that a VC is going to care about if they're just using you as a pump and dump. Absolutely. And the, the problem with that is that it fuels a litany of disasters. The first thing is, Uh, you put pressure on your customer. You're constantly cannibalizing your pipeline for next quarter to try and make this quarter's quota. Mm. That then creates an extra tariff on the uh, SDR function and marketing to try and backfill the 10, 15, 20% that you've stolen. Then you add to that the fact that you end up selling to people you shouldn't have sold to, which adds to the churn rate. An average of 15% churn is shockingly bad. Mm. That means you lose 49% of your customers every three years. So you've got to replace them to stand still. This puts additional pressure on management, on the sales team, on the SDR team, on marketing. So most of your money that you spend on salaries, most of the money you spend on marketing, lead generation, is wasted. Your cost of sale is astronomical. It takes roughly 3,240 touches to get to a second meeting. And on average, seven out of eight first meetings do not result in a second. Well, it gets worse than that because they lose their promoters. They lose their their core of customers who are the biggest advocates. I can give you an example of of this um, if it's not going to get you sued. I can always delete it. (laughs) (laughs) So this is kicking off right now. There's um, a company called Agile Bits. Uh, They produce a password management software tool called Mm 1Password. And I've been using them personally for about 12 or 13 years. Back when I was at Apple, they were the darling of everyone in B. Well, not I wouldn't say everybody, but, you know, we would collectively have introduced them to thousands of new customers. And they were absolutely a darling. And they're their growth was being driven by people like us who were promoting them to others. Fast forward a few years, they've taken a bunch of VC capital. Um, they've hired a bunch of salespeople. Feedback I've been hearing is that they're not very good. There's a fair bit of high pressure tactics going on because the only way they can grow is turning themselves now into an enterprise product. 
in other words, to make the VC's investment look justifiable. Um, and they're getting absolutely destroyed on social media, on Reddit, because their next software product is going to be a massive regression from what they've been shipping, because it's the sort of product that's going to suit, or maybe not even suit, but it's the sort of product that, that might suit their target audience, but it's going to alienate the sort of people that have driven their growth up to this point. I just sort of think to myself, like, how dumb and toxic is the impact of 100 million of VC capital? Well, these to um, be short-term decisions. De definitely read an article by Altos.V for Victor, C for Charlie, called The Series B Trap and How to Avoid It. So I'll quickly summarize. You get pumped in a bucket load of money at Series B. And so your company's been growing and scaling well often on very little investment. Then you decide you're ready to scale and you raise millions. So you get a great big chunk of money having pitched these venture funds on a big growth story. The investors pay a high valuation to get a good deal and betting on a continued fast growth track. Then what happens? In order to meet the growth and revenue targets, you hire and spend like you've never spent before. So you rush out, you rush a few key hires, you overbuild the team, and immediately what you see happening is compromise on recruitment in sales mm -hmm. and in middle management. You ramp up your marketing spend, and a few quarters in, you realize that the product's not quite where you thought it would be, and you're not quite so far up the learning curve in sales as you thought, and your LTV and your uh, cost of acquiring customer is suddenly down the loop. But now it's too late to change course. You've got egos attached. You don't want the embarrassment. And after several consecutive quarters of high burn, missed targets, lowered expectations, you've lost a year, and now you're, you've spent 10, 15, 20 million. And the investors are really peeved. Hmm. And then you fall into this death spiral. The head of sales gets replaced, replaced once, twice, three times. The CEO gets replaced once, twice, three times. And then there's a down round financing, um, if you're lucky or you just tank and you get sold off for parts. Now, that is what you're just describing. Mm. It bothers me because, well, <laughs> it bothers me because of the human damage that's being done to yeah. the people that have been recruited. And their customers. Well, and, yeah, exactly. But, I mean, it's worth mentioning as well, because a lot of these companies are going to be recruiting people that are relatively young. They're at the very beginning of their careers. They're going to be excited, and they're going to end up being burned and they're going to end up leaving the sales profession thinking, I'm not doing that again, which I think well, is the, terrible. The mental shame. health, the mental health issues. Silke Ahrens and Martin Behrens run the mental health podcast. And that was fueled because of the pressure that they felt, but also the, uh, the burnout that they see in mm. you know, 23, 24, 25, 26 year olds. I mean, for God's sake, what, why is it that the sales profession, uh, sorry, the sales management? in sales believes that it's okay to use human beings this way. And th this is why I have a real issue with the uh, term human capital. It devalues human beings. Now, I'm no tree hugger, as anyone who knows me will, uh, will know, but it does seem amoral it, and it's obscene and there's no need for it. So it, it, what baffles me is the commercial model actually is underperforming dramatically. I mean, I hate Milton Friedman's concept that every business is there to serve shareholder value or deliver shareholder value, because I think shareholders come last. Your customers and your employees and your community come well before the shareholder. And the shareholder benefits if you look after those people and those mm -hmm. stakeholders. And um, the uh, study that was done on the S&P 500 over six years shows that employees who are highly engaged and having people dialed through a list of 10,000 contacts with only 2% of them being in the market to buy is a soul-destroying, miserable experience. Now, where your employees are highly engaged, you get 430% higher profit per employee. But the really interesting uh, statistic was the 316% year-on-year compound share price growth higher 
within companies that had highly engaged employees than companies that had mildly engaged or actively disengaged employees. Mm. So if you want to sh serve shareholder value, treat people decently. Give them interesting work. I interviewed Alfie Cohn, who is the author of a book every manager and leader should read. And it's called Punished by Rewards. And it's looking at the data on the actual impact of compensation schemes that have commission, that reward people for results, because it focuses them on extrinsic reward rather than on, than on intrinsic reward. And so I'm going through this massive dilemma because I have to let go of 35 years of thinking that commission is the right way to go. And uh, instead, look at how we can help reward everybody collectively, but not for doing their job. Doing their job should be reward in itself. Have you seen Vision Link advisory groups work on this topic? I, I haven't, no. Yeah, check them out. It's really, really interesting. I might be butchering this, but they advocate pay everybody a very, very good basic up to the point that they're delivering on their target and their target should be completely aligned to the company target. Right? So you know, you're not saying, ah, oh, your target is actually 150% of what the company's target would make it, make it fair, and then give them a very healthy slice, 30, 50% of any value that they create above what would deliver the company target. And I like that approach a lot because what it's incentivizing is obviously people to go you know, to, uh, to top performance, but it then leads to the sort of incentives like long-term customer health, you know, ret customer retention, which really does deliver those, the better company values. Because if you're just targeting new logos and those customers churn, the odds that you're actually going to make any bloody money off that, off, off that customer are very low. I, I do a load of work in the tech space. And what fascinates me is how it can possibly take 18 months to make a profit. It's not like you're selling anything other than electrons. I mean, you um, just said uh, that it's that your the BDRs are only productive twenty five percent of the time, and account executives are productive, God knows what small percentage of the time. So, is it that surprising? Well, it shouldn't be, but it, I mean, it still uh, amazes me that uh, leadership and management, when the the results are um, sorry, the evidence is out there, but the results are not, as my, my pal Mark Schaefer says. I think we need to take a, a really good look at ourselves. The, the reason you and I have uh, established sales of force for good, uh, along with others, is precisely to ask these gnarly, shitty, horrible, uncomfortable questions and slap leadership and management around the face with them so that they have to um, pay heed and, and look at themselves in the mirror. Because what I'm seeing consistently is blind, delusional um, zombie management. They keep doing what never worked, and they're reinforcing it, and they end up just doubling down on stupid. You know, if, if you want to double your sales, double your headcount, double your dials, double the number of demos, double the number of proposals, double your marketing spend, it doesn't fucking work. <laughs> it works for a handful of organizations, but the majority, you would be better just pouring petrol on all that cash and you know, running a generator. At least well, you'd get some warmth out of it. Well, Marcus, this is, a, this is probably a good segue for me to maybe sort of end on a sort of relatively personal note, which is the sort of final piece of what I think the future of enablement should be. And this is, this, is, this is sort of very personal and emotive topic for me, which is, look, everyone, in enab everyone that's good in enablement should be able to earn three or four times the amount of money they're earning if they were actually in sales. I want to you know, suggest that I would be um, myself, but I'd like to think so. So they're doing this for a reason that is beyond money. The, low, the, the bad ones are probably doing it just to get off the phone, but the ones that are good, they're doing it because they're motivated by some other factor. For me, I want to turn sales from an unprofession to a profession. But one of the other reasons is I actually think that sales is a better education for young people than university in most cases. Fine, if you want to go study nuclear physics or medicine, fair enough. But... I would love to see more young people learning the skills that are necessary to succeed in sales because it's going to make them more effective human beings. And that's something that I love. That's what I get out of bed for. And what I would suggest is, you know, look, we talk about management issues. We talk about structural reasons why companies are going to fail. I'll be frank with you. That's way above my pay grade. 
what I see in these organizations where I go in, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, I can talk, certainly talk about and observe, but I look at the effect it has on these young people in these organizations. And I think, you know what? A good sales enablement person also needs to be a little bit of a therapist, needs to be a bit of a coach, and needs to be able to work with these young people and say, look, let's talk about how to get effective in the world. Let's think about how you can succeed despite some of the crap that goes on in these companies and the poor decision making. And I talk, I think to myself about some of the kids I've worked with in my time. I think about some of like one young lady I, I did some coaching with, for example, two or three years ago, not in a good place, had come from a very, very bad background. And she's now built a pretty solid career and is thinking about starting her own business. And that's all before the age of 25. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, all right, there's, there's some purpose here that goes beyond, you know, just, I mean, as much as I'm a customer focused, that's going to be the title of the next book. That's another responsibility of a good sales enablement person. How do you feel about that? In the last two weeks, I've had people from uh, two to nine years ago who, uh, uh, that I worked with come back to me to thank me for uh, helping them put their career on the right path. One of them uh, contacted me with a message on uh, a couple of Fridays ago that literally brought tears to my eyes. He, in the, the last half year, he billed more than he did in the previous full year. And I haven't worked with him for 10, uh, 11 months. And uh, he's cleared all his debts. He's never been so happy. And he feels like he's in full control of his uh, career and his life. He's applied these skills in his life. So negotiating with landlords, helping his girlfriend work through a difficult situation at work. And you're absolutely right. Sales is a microcosm of life done well. And my favorite bit of um, his uh, voicemail was, I've never done so little and got paid so much. And the, my, my entire philosophy is based on uh, Greg McEwen's fabulous book, Essentialism, which is do less but better on purpose. And this is why all the stuff we've been talking about frustrates me. If you think about one of the most important laws of physics in terms of the conservation of energy, why are we not thinking like a physicist? Why are we not thinking, what can we do less of and get more bang for our buck? Instead of this ludicrous idea that you have to work harder. And Beck Collins said uh, something really profound. Why is it that sales and marketing organizations are paying twice as much to get half as much done? Mm. And uh, on that note, I think we should probably end. Any, any final words before we, uh, we wrap up? Yeah, look, just as there are big differences between performance in salespeople, there are going to be big differences in the performance of sales enablement people. And I would really encourage any senior sales leader to look at the work that your enablement team are doing and ask some serious questions. Is it aligned to the needs of the customer? Are we creating buyer safety? Are we creating an environment where quite frankly, you know, we're developing those trust and collaborative behaviors that we need? Are we involved in recruitment? If we're teaching things, are they being taught in a way that's seller-friendly? Are we thinking of accountability? And if the answer to any of those questions is no, then you need to hold your enablement team accountable because what you don't want to create is the sort of sales L&D because it just ain't going to work. But then on the flip side, you know, look at the way that your, your enablement team of working with those younger sellers that you have in the business. Don't treat them, and I made the mistake of using this phrase earlier, and treat them as human capital. Treat them as your future top performers and ask what are we investing in their success in the longer term. And I would add to that that you've got to, in parallel or even ahead of that, um, focus on enabling your managers. Um, because Jonathan Farrington's study at the end of 2020 said that 94% of sales managers were not fit for purpose. And that's definitely the most pivotal point within your sales operation. And if those people are not, and never, ever have a player manager, as soon as you can get away from that, you know, if you're, uh, you're know, turning over 100,000, then get rid of the player manager and put the manager in charge of hiring the best people, getting the best out of them, making sure they have the tools and resources they need to do their best work every day, 
helping clear roadblocks and protect them from acts of idiocy from your senior leadership and manage inclusively. And train your managers and enable your managers, rather, to be managers. Their job is to hire the best people and get the best out of them. It is not to be hero closers. It is not to carry a quota. That type of idiocy is a false economy. And unless those two things happen in parallel, then I fundamentally believe great ideas that you've come up with are doomed to fail. Because if the managers are not party to all of this and they are not equipped, everything will turn to shit. And you'll still just uh, depend on the 2 or 3% who focus on their own learning and development. Amen. Excellent. Okay. So one uh, final cheeky question. You've got a golden ticket. You can go back and advise the idiot Ben age 23. Uh, what one bit of advice would you give him? Ooh, I would say get mentors. Don't be proud about it. Absolutely. Something I, something I um, you know, look, I, I hope you don't mind me blowing a little bit of smoke up your backside, but, you know, I consider you a mentor and learning from people that are one or two years older than me is something that... <laughs> one or two uh, hundred. Oh, <laughs> you're, you're a beautiful man, Marcus. Thank you. <laughs> I'm an all-rounder. <laughs> I'm very round. Well, <laughs> I, I am in shape. The shape I've selected is a triangle. Um, <laughs> it's, it took me a long time to realise that I was much more effective as Robin instead of Batman. And that would be the, the thing I would say to myself at 23 after slapping him about the chops a little bit. Very interesting. Oh, sorry. There's... <laughs> my guttering appears to be uh, loosening, loosening a load of stuff. I think we need to clean them. So, okay, um, you, you've mentioned a couple of books, uh, Sales Enablement 3.0 and Tech Powered Sales. Mm -hmm. um, is there a, one other book around mindset um, or belief systems that uh, maybe you'd recommend? Yes, but in a roundabout way. It's a, it's a bit heavy going, but I'd really recommend a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. It's not a sales book, and it's certainly not an easy read. It's a book about comparative mythology. And he looks at different stories that people have been telling for thousands of years and identifies, he calls it a monomyth. So, you know, the role of a hero um, as they go through their particular journey. And as sellers, we need to think about that and think about our role on our customer's hero's journey. What are we doing? And if we're that we are ourselves trying to be the hero, we might be playing the wrong role. So I'd really encourage having um, having a go on the book. It's uh, like I say, it's not an easy read, but uh, once you can get into it, it's mind blown. Well, on that note, uh, read widely, read history, um, behavioral economics, psychology, read politics, biographies. Don't just stick to your uh, swim lane, because the more widely read you are, the more connections you can make. And to build on Ben's earlier point, in future, you are going to have to be incredibly flexible and agile. And you'll need to going to be able to synthesize ideas that come from multiple different sources. One of my favorite uh, Audible courses is a course called From Yao to Mao, and it's a 4,000-year history of China. If you want to understand geopolitics today, and you want to understand influence, and you want to understand how to manage complexity, it's a fabulous starting point. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I would urge all of you to do when it comes out is my interview with a chap called Alexander Knapp, and uh, he specializes in solving wicked problems. And the stuff we are talking about is a wicked problem. It's complex, it's diverse, it's confusing. And when managing wicked problems, it's important that you understand there are four fundamental rules. The first one is that the first solution will fail. So capture data, analyze it, try and work out why. Secondly, stakeholders differ. The third is the rules change as you play. And the fourth is there is no perfect answer, only imperfect options. So definitely keep an eye out for that one. Alexander Knapp, Wicked Problems. Excellent. Okay, so Ben, um, how can people get hold of you? My website is inkandben.com. 
You can find me on, uh, on LinkedIn. Um, I theoretically have a Twitter account, but I don't use it. LinkedIn is probably your best bet if you want to start a conversation. Excellent. Ben Elijah, thank you. Thank you. So this is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you found this useful, then please like, comment, share, and tag someone who needs to hear this, the message contained in this episode. And if you're feeling generous, hop across to Apple or Google Podcasts or wherever uh, you normally listen and give the podcast an honest review and give feedback. If there's a way that I can improve it, then please let me know. Tell me the kind of stuff that you've particularly enjoyed so we can get more of it. And in the meantime, if you want to get hold of me, Marcus at laughs-last.com. Stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.